also mentioning, I didn't mention before, I get time to study here, on the, the fluorescent lights, they usually need to be on about 16 hours a day. I think it's in that handout that I gave you. And I have a timer, so I don't have to go ahead and turn them on and off. And it's just like a Christmas tree timer or those others. And, but you've got to be careful about putting too much on a house circuit. I think I've written that in there too. But it'll automatically turn the lights, <coughs> excuse me, on and off as needed. Now, the reason that I was going to go through this really quickly, hopefully, is because um, within this one I've done some things on fertility and I've done on, on a little bit on, on control of weeds. And this, some people think this is a, a, a lab, but that's one thing you have to do. Ho, ho, ho. And we, that's, what it is, that's why I say living in the garden. You have to be out there and watching the things that are going on. And most weeds can be taken care of if you at least get back. Most garden books, a lot of these say, if you get out there every two weeks and keep the weeds down, you won't have a weed problem. And they, even Canadian thistle, which is a really hard, hard one, they say if you till that every 21 days, keep it till you can get rid of it. But it is a real, if you miss, then you're in trouble. And I do that a lot, unfortunately. And when you think about what is a weed, Basically, it's a plant out of place. And I think I'll show. Does anybody know what that is? Cabbage. No, it's romaine lettuce. But you know, it's, it went to seed in the greenhouse, I think, one year, and it planted along the side here. So basically, that's a weed. But you know what you can do with weeds? You can eat them. You can eat them, right? <laughs> <laughs> so even, you know, like dandelion, lamb's quarter, all those are, are purslane, those are edible. Throw them in your salads with your greens, they're very good. <laughs> now, we have to identify these, these weeds that we come to so you can find out how it spreads. Like crabgrass is a really bad one, unless it's by stolons, but I'll get into that in a minute. And then you can pick a method for getting rid of that. And you want to take some kind of steps to keep it coming back. Plastic mouse, a lot of people said they laid black plastic over the whole, whole garden and they had creeping ginny, field vine weed. And that takes care of that weed, they said. But you have to make sure you go out beyond where, where it is. I've seen it come up through concrete. So it's unbelievable what that stuff can do. But most weeds that we deal with a lot are, are annuals. And the annuals basically just spread by seeds. Its entire life cycle takes place in just one year. That's why they call it an annual. Like lamb's quarter, pigweed, wild oats, wild buckwheat. One thing interesting about some of these is wild buckwheat, for instance, if that goes to seed, that seed stays viable in the soil for over 20 years. So it is, and it looks almost like uh, field bindweed, but it's not. If you pull it up, you can see the, the, the fibrous rip that goes on it. If you'll bind me, it'll go down 18 feet. It goes way down to the soil. And now biennials, the second year, they go to seed, and they pr produce that. And that's like Queen Anne's lace, bull thistle, common burdock. And a lot of people think that dandelions is, a, a, is an annual, but it's not. It's perennial. It's, it will stay in the soil, and it will come back year after year. And at least like any of those three years or more, they classify as uh, perennial. And you can see those like the stolons and rosones, and it, per and it also produces seeds. So you've got to look at all those things you have to look at. And even milkweed, you see those along the side of the road? That keeps coming back year after year. And sometimes I hate to kill the milkweed off because that's a, a harbor for the, the monarch butterflies. They feed mainly on that, that weed. And then, of course, Canadian thistle. And basically, the, the physical approach is like mowing, digging. Now, fire, basically, they have these machines out that will actually burn or fire the soil. They have some places where they have machines that you can pull behind the tractor and you can do it. Or you can just use a little torch that you have one of these big fire buster torches. You can use some of those but it'll kill all the plants. It doesn't just kill, kill the, the weeds. A lot of people have used that for carrots that are slow germinating. They'll let the other weeds germinate on top and they'll pass over the top of the soil quickly with a torch, burn the top off and that kills the weeds and gives room for the carrots to come through. And there's ways you can do that. Now, solarizing is, is just basically using high heat 
to take care of the weed seeds. And you can do that by using the sun's energy, by putting white uh, plastic without holes and things in it to a pile, especially in the greenhouse, because greenhouses this time of year we get to 150 degrees, believe it or not. And so I have to have fans running to, to make sure it, it keeps cool enough, because that would kill plants. A friend of mine had a, a, a greenhouse over the hill from us, and he had a, his computer was plugged into the wall, a wall socket, and the wind was shaking so bad it fell out of the socket. And he wasn't by, didn't have any way of knowing what happened, and it got to 150 in the greenhouse, and the tomatoes were actually cooked on the plant. And so it's, that's kind of sickening. So I, I've got a, my, my, my greenhouses are hooked to a, what they call a alert system. It's a sensor phone, and it will call me if my greenhouse temperature drops below 50 or goes above 90. So if I get a phone call, then I got to have somebody do that or get back there as soon as I can. So, but that's because you know, that's my living. So I have to make sure I try to keep it as safe as possible. Still, things happen. And uh, some other crops really work well. Whoops. Like ryegrass is is allopathic. In other words, it'll stop other weed seed from germinating. So that's a really good one. Winter dry is excellent. Buckwheat, white clover, winter wheat and sorghum, all those can be used to, as other crops. And but my favorite is probably the rye grass, but I use a lot of alfalfas and, and, and the yellow sweet clover. So white, white has a lot bigger, heavier stem to it. It's a little bit later, but it is still also good. Now there is organic herbicides. I haven't used any of these. There is corn gluten that people said that it works pretty well. Salt, I would not recommend because you kill everything else too. And you can do some vinegars. I did try some vinegar on some field buying wheat, and I didn't think it, I think it may grow better. So I don't know if it worked or not. And there is some I've never used the herbicidal soap, but those are some of the books that they say are available to try to use. The biggest thing I think is just use this approach and get rid of especially the annuals that are in there. And there is bur the mulch, there's burlap bags. A lot of times you can get those from places and lay those out for a mulch, and that biodegrades. A lot of people have used that to start new lawns. And of course you can use paper, cardboard, compost, and all these different ones use. And then the main one I use is plastic because it's easy and it's not, not real time consuming. And I can you know, lay a 300 foot roll of plastic in you know, five, six minutes. And because it, it uncovers it and covers it and lays the drip lines all at once for me. And I set it up to do that. And you can see this is kohlrabi laid on white plastic and it's on the edge of the greenhouse. The edge of the greenhouse, is, the soil temperature here is probably 10 to 20 degrees cooler than it is on the other side of the greenhouse. And again, you've seen some of these pictures. Here's a drip line, and there's the uh, cucumber plants. And this is for the older greenhouses. I used to, I used to put two peppers beside each other, and I'd drop a string down, each one go up, and now I just drop one pepper in there, and the pepper will split into two, and I use, I put a string on each one of those, and that works just as good without as much work putting as many plants in and using as much seed. And a lot of people do that with uh, <coughs> tomato plants now too. They're starting to separate that into two plants going up, but it's harder to lean and lower. Yes. What's the purpose of putting two pepper plants together like that? Because they, they say you get a bigger yield, and I didn't notice it, because you train it to one single step mm -hmm. up, the, up the plant, and you don't have a, a, double, a double stem going that can break easier. And if something happens to one plant, then you have another one to fall back on. But I, I didn't have much problem with it, so I just went to one, and I had real good luck that way. And you can see again here the, the whoops. <laughs> I keep hitting the wrong button. The carrots and this cucumber on the side of them. And these usually be ready uh, end of June, beginning of July. If I don't plant them too thick, the thicker you plant the carrot, the longer it's going to draw the season out. And this is kohlrabi here on the side. You can see the bigger plants. And the peppers just starting to grow big here. And you can see the, the, this is one of the older ones now. You can see up here, the, one of the best place to time to save fertilizing is not to fertilize. <laughs> so you can do that use using green manure crops. You can use, there is uh, turkey mulch, and there is compost, of course, you can get. Sometimes you can get it for free. Some farmers will just give it away. And, but 
If you're feeding soil, like I said, with compost and keep it covered with organic mulch, most of the plants won't even need any supplemental feeding. Now, that's more for outside of the greenhouse. The greenhouse is very intensive, and in a space where you usually grow one plant, I'm growing six or eight plants. Now, I just showed you that. I, use a, I have a, a wheel cultivator that I welded two bolts on, and I just roll that down the middle of my mulch, and it marks out a hole every 36 to 38 inches, and that's where I set my tomato plants and the melons and the pumpkins and the cucumbers and all that, so, but it works very fast. And you can measure that easily that way too. But basically, if you you put mulch on there, you really don't need some of these supplemental feedings. And you can watch your plant; you can tell if it needs needs something extra most of the time. And you can see this is a tomato plant, and I don't know if you can tell it from there, but it's already setting a blossom cluster there. It's not blooming yet, but it's a cluster that's starting to come out. Now these. These plants, when I plant them, I put a couple tablespoons of, of what they call fish emulsion. My wife hates the smell of it. But <laughs> when I did the basement, it was really a problem. Now I'm out in a separate building, it's a little bit you can put up with it more. And then I use some sea crop, which is trace minerals. And that's in your hand down too. So, and that's to give the plant a boost to get it started. And you can see these plants are very healthy. Soil temperature, like I mentioned earlier, I use a soil probe and I like it to be 60 to 65 degrees. And that just, even this one, this particular soil probe tells you minimum soil temperature for plants. And it says 60 degrees is minimum for squash, cucumbers, beans, peppers, and melons. And it goes a little bit lower for the some of the other ones, like it says 50, 55 for corn, asparagus, and tomatoes. But I don't agree with it on that. I think you need a higher temperature for your tomatoes and your, your corn, especially if you're not using fungicides. And I don't recommend using any of those poisons on your, on your stuff. And like I said, here is a, a meter that shows the temperature, and I just leave it in there. Believe it or not, this soil temperature in this greenhouse, well, I looked at mine yesterday and it was 80 degrees, the soil temperature in the greenhouse. Now the air temperature was about 65. Now you can run hot water lines and stuff and heat up the soil. They do that a lot now with hydroponics, but I don't do it, of course, any of that. But uh, this really helps out. But believe it or not, the soil will stabilize about 65 degrees when this crop canopy is over. Remember the one with the tomatoes that reached to the ceiling? The, the energy of the sun isn't getting to the soil anymore, and it just stays at 65 degrees. It stays right there. Now I talked about pH a little, little bit. But said my water was a pH of about eight, which I don't have to worry worry about because I'm using it to buy to the soil is a big buffer. See, so even when I irrigate with that, it doesn't seem to affect the, the soil at all. And when I'm using it with my plants, I already have the the peat moss in there that is very acid, and so that balances each, each other out. And push the right button. Now, seven being neutral is most of the things where plants grow in that. And I like this 6.8 seven, six, to 7.2, which is most of the farmland around here is already that. And I see I've got white stuff that's on the top, that alkaline, then it gets really in that high range. And most sources say from 6 to 7.5 is okay for, for growing. Now if you're growing something like uh, blueberries or some azaleas, some, some depth like acid soil, but look that up, grapes like an acid soil. So look some of that up, and you can put some sulfur, or add something to your soil that will buffer that and try to keep the pH down. And even a lot of your uh, your trees will have some acid, especially your pine trees have a, an acid to them. But if you can wash the plant, if you see it's okay, I wouldn't mess with it, don't worry about it. But you can test your water, there's a lot of places that can you can send off. Some of those tests are pretty reasonable for your less than $20, 30 dollars and get it tested. And you can buy test kits that'll test that for you too. And they go by colors and Sudbury has a real test, nice test kit out. And you can do those, it'll tell you some of those. And now, a lot of people like to eat, I don't use any of the siphons or injectors. And you can add different things to your, your plants. Even the fish emulsion tends to clog the lines up and it tends to mold if you use that. So I put it directly into the soil. I don't try to run it through my drip lines, which a lot of people like to do. And you can use, they say, an acid to clean it out, or you can just use vinegar to clean that line out. But uh, most of the time, I don't, 
I don't mess with it because I just make sure the soil has enough nutrients in it to get through that season. Now these are your, your main, some call it the major nutrients, and the macro, and this is most listed as NPK. Now you can't buy some organic fertilizers with those in it, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And these are the primary or the macronutrients, and then a lot of them are secondary nutrients. A lot of people are, are kicking in on this calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Now it's really funny that most of your water here in North Dakota has a lot of calcium already in it. So you don't really need to add much. Or don't need to add any. <laughs> and then these are the trace minerals, and these you need a very, very small amounts. And most of the time your 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 sea kelps, any of those have all that in it. You go to a, a store that has those trace minerals that you can just add. It takes very, very little, like a, a tablespoon in a, in a gallon of water will do a, a real lot. It'll do a, like I said, if I use a tablespoon per, per plant on the greenhouse, I don't even use a gallon. You know, the greenhouses are 30 foot wide by 128 foot long. And so you, and it's, seems like they're expensive, but for what you're getting, it's very inexpensive. And these are different organic sources, and ground alfalfa meal is real good. And like I said, that if you have the possibility to be able to get alfalfa hay or you grow some in your own yard, use that to mulch with. Most ones say, though, it takes, if you want to do an acre of garden, it takes 20 acres of alfalfa to mulch that. That's what sources say. I don't know if it's really that big. It just depends on, on the season, I think, of how much you get and how thick you put it. But alfalfa is a, a big nutrient and a, a, a real good balance. And blood meal is the thing that you can get. And I don't recommend blood meal because you never know what else is in it. Cottonseed meal is real good. Fish meal is just basically dried fish. And that's an, an excellent sor source. And now this one, a lot of people are afraid of it. This bat guano. And I don't think you have to be afraid of it. It's pelletized already. But it, they don't think it's organic because it's a real high it's a high nitrogen content. Most of the time when you buy that, it'll come pearled and it'll be like a 16%. And most of the time if things are above 10, you don't consider it organic. And I'll get into that in just a minute. And of course, legumes. Growing legumes will add a lot of stuff to your soil. And that's what, of course, alfalfa is and your sweet clovers, your beans, your peas, any of those are, are a good legume source. Vetch, vetch is a real good source. And this is different. Sources of phosphorus, bone meal, rock phosphate, colonial phosphate, these are all naturally occurring. Fish and balsam, liquid seaweed, and of course animal manures will also have phosphorus. And those are ones that you can fairly easily available. And potassium, that's something usually North Dakota has a lot of. Our soils are heavy in potassium. And so usually you don't have to worry about that, but there is. Now what I use a lot in the greenhouses, the main one that I use, whoops, is, I've got to push the middle button, is the green sand. And it's unbelievable, a, little, a bag about, about this size and about that thick weighs 50 pounds. I mean, it's, it's about like this. When you pick that thing up, it's like picking up a rock. <laughs> and it's, it's really heavy, it's concentrated. And the soluble egg is a real, real good lanthanite, people call it, but that's a, a, a good source too. And like I say again, kelp meal for trace minerals. Now, whoops. Wood, a ah, keep the wrong one. wood ashes, it's a lime that sweetens the soil, and it can be good for wood, but do not, never use coal ashes. Coal ashes will turn to sulfuric acid, it will burn your plants right off. So that you can't, can't use, if any coal stuff in it, you don't want to use it at all. And a lot of times they say, most sources say, mix it in your, your compost, and then add it to your garden and sweeten things up. <coughs> And like I mentioned before, if a combination is over 15, they say it's probably not organic. Like if you see something 888 or 202020, that's been acidized to release the nutrients faster, and it kills your bacteria in your soil and can hurt the earthworms. It's just too high. And that's what I think a lot of people have with this, the bat guano, because it's so concentrated. Because it can hurt some of your, if you use it very, very sparingly, maybe okay, but it does, it's like uh, the last that I looked at was 1600. So that's a pretty high concentration. And it's, uh, you know, even they'll say on the bag it's uh, oh, you call it a fire hazard because it will, it's very ignitable. Um, 
and see if it's not here. And if any single nutrient over 10, it's probably not organic. And I said, except for this an exception, like 10 to 2, probably not. Now there is out of uh, Minnesota, and I think there's a, a place out of just south of Fargo that sells, a, they sell an 822 that is, is organic. It's a turkey litter, and they sell a 6, I think it's a 644 or 466, I remember. That's, that's basically all it is, is a, a compost of turkey litter. And it's, it's a up there one if you want to go that route, but if you, you keep the organic matter up in the soil, I don't think you really have to worry about it. And these are, this is showing the green, so there's a little bit of phosphorus deficiency. That's because of the fr heavy fruit load that's on the plants. And it straightens out itself when it gets up a little bit higher, a little bit later on, and these are, are picked off, off the fruit. The fruit is picked off of there, but does that look good? Doesn't that look delicious? <laughs> yes. And you can see that the tomatoes, now once in a while, if you don't have a, let's see if I can remember which button, on the bottom end here of the tomato, you can see the, the that's how the blossom end, and sometimes you'll end up with what they call a blossom end rot, and that's usually due to calcium deficiency or inconsistent watering. If it's dry and all of a sudden give it a bunch of water, then a lot of times it'll get that, that blossom end scar will not take up the nitrogen because it, it has too much water, and so the calcium is, excuse me, isn't taken off. And so that makes that blossom end scar predominant, and it can drop the whole tomato sometimes. Sometimes it'll just be a little bit and it'll heal itself. But this is that uh, perfection pepper I was telling you, like Bianca. And these are uh, just a delicious pepper. Not my favorite, but it is a really good, and it's a thick walled pepper. This is my favorite pepper. This is a bull nose pepper instead of a bell pepper. And this one's called Carmen. And you can see it's, it is good green, but I sell them all red at markets. And it's very sweet. It's hard to get them to turn outside. You will turn sometime. But if they even start to get a hint of turn at the end before frost, pick them, bring them inside, excuse me, and they will finish turning red. And they'll still have a really good flavor to it. Okay. Now, is there any, any other questions? I was going to go to one more. Get to it. Uh, that's a lot of information real quick <laughs> and there's a lot of other things that I, I could tell you about but what I was going to try to go to is I took some pictures last week if I can see if I can I hope not. <laughs> yep. This is, uh, this is, this, these were taken a week ago. Now, believe it or not, the plants that you're seeing there now, because they were put in April 1st, and so they're twice the size now. When you come in May, you're going to see an unbelievable difference. They'll probably have four or five clusters of fruit already set on them, on the tomatoes. But this is a this is a pepper greenhouse, and there's one back here that I'm going to set outside, and there's some uh, eggplant back there too, and I have eggplant in this back end. Two types of eggplant, I have galene and, um, not millionaire, it's Orient Express. And that's a, a long Japanese eggplant, a lot stronger flavored, and really, really good. The Japanese really, really like it, the Asians really like it. And the, the galene is just a regular, or some people call it the American, the big round eggplant. And it's it's a, a good eggplant too. And now, this side is the, these two sides are completely, I doubled the number I grew this year on those. And this is those carbon, the red, the bull nose pepper, the one I just showed you. And this one is a new one because I couldn't get the seed for the gourmet this year. So I tried this one, it's Sprinter. It's a green to yellow bell pepper, yellow orange, and then this one over here is one of my favorites. It's, it's called a snapper. It's a big, heavy, thick walled green bell pepper that turns red. And I'll have red peppers probably in June, I think, from here. And then the as far side is that Bianca. And that Bianca is the white to yellow to orange to red, red pepper. And on the sides here, 
if you can't really see it, but I have beets and carrots planted there, you'll be able to see them pretty easily when they come in May. And this is going to be the greenhouse that has the, the cucumbers in it. The cucumbers are already up. I planted them on the 13th, and their plants are about that big now. I was going to put them in earlier, but I'm going to try to get some bait. I'm going to get some bran, bran meal and some molasses and, and mix with some uh, uh, BT and see if I can get some of those cutworms. Because and they say you can also put a collar around the plant, and I might do both. Just <laughs> for extra insurance, because these these cucumber plants that I grow are like 80 cents a seed, mm. so they're expensive. Because of, you know, how do you get seed from a from a seedless cucumber? But you can you can do it. There's some I've had some male possums. I thought about doing some myself, but I just haven't messed with it. I probably should try it. That's much bigger. Uh, now, these are ones I set on the side of the greenhouse. Uh, this is the kohlrabi. And these are that same jig that I used for the onions. I just punch the holes by hand all the way down, and then I set one in each hole. And these will be ready. I'll have some of those be ready in May, probably. They'll be really close if they're not. And this is. A favorite. I've just started to growing more and more of that. That's kale, and that's been a, a real. And the big thing is when it's grown in the kale house, in the greenhouse, excuse me, kale house. Yeah, it has a real sweet flavor. And sometimes outside it tends to get a little bit strong in your drinks. But this is as as mild as you can get, but it still seems to have all the nutrient value that you need. Now this is the tomato greenhouse. And I have fans that circulate the air. This circulates heat up top here. It's a jet fan, but I'll show you more of that when you get to come to the greenhouses. But uh, let's see if, the right button. if you can see on the sides here, these plants were started about a week or so earlier than these here. And so they're a little bit bigger. These plants today, I, I went out and I strung strings on them, and I, they're about twice that size today. This is a, from a week ago. And they have blossoms, they're starting to blossom. So I went out with, I have an electric toothbrush that vibrates, and I just hit the cl blossom cluster with that toothbrush, and it shakes the pollen out and gets that tomato to start setting quicker. And so that's already been done for just some early tomatoes for us. I'm hoping that those will come by, by the first part of uh, June, but we'll see. But you'll see some of those, the difference of those. And the back here, you can't really see it, but there's a little spaces. I had a lot of cut worm I transplanted. I probably transplanted over about 200 plants and the cut worms cut off on me. In this greenhouse, there's 905 tomato plants. It seems like there's not very many on the front end, but oh, you can see. There's some got right here, these three plants here, I had a, he a replant. So, and I'm not sure all of the reason for it, but every year something's new. You just have to go with the flow and not get too upset because it didn't help. <laughs> and uh, I think I should go back. This white stuff that you see, most books said that uh, that's not a major shirt. They said that's supposed to stop them, but it doesn't, didn't seem to help. I circled the plant, sprinkled it on the plant, did a lot of different things, and they, they seemed to went right over it. So I don't know what the, the deal was. If they came underneath the plastic, I had it next to the plant, so they should have got it too. But sometimes you just have to keep experimenting, keep trying. Never give up. <laughs> now this one is, oh, this was a, this one I'm maybe going to have for green manure crop, but I grew some extra uh, two types, uh, green, green magic and blue whale broccoli, and they're from Johnny Select Seeds, and by the time market starts in June, these will probably all be done. So, but I'll, I, we have put a bunch in the freezer for us, and then I have a few people that wanted to buy some from us, and so we'll do that. And on the side here is lettuce. We've been eating lettuce for a while already. And this is the, the setup at our place looking from the highway. This is, I think this greenhouse I got in about 90, 93 or 4. We got that from Keith Cadmus down over the hill from us. And this one, a guy started hydroponics in it. And he gave up after less than a year. And so I bought it from him, took all the hydroponic stuff out, and put it right in the soil again. 
And so that was, that was about 97, I think, or so. And these I just put up this year. Took a two-year thing for me to, between everything else, to get them put up. But those, this one has tomatoes, this one's gonna have cucumbers, this one has the broccoli, and this one has the peppers in it. And so that's basically, there's a big head house across here, and I have a cooler in the head house and cooler in this big, this barn back here is a 80 feet by 105 feet long. Doesn't look like it from there, and the house is back behind here. So when you come down the highway, all the 200, if you see these, you'll just take the next right turn, the next right turn into our driveway. And that's basically all I have, so I thought well, there's, probably have a lot of questions, maybe, <laughs> but if you don't, you can always call me. My wife had some business cards, I think she gave out too. And yes? How do you keep mice out of the garden? <laughs> <laughs> Mice can be a real trick. You can live trap, and if you have pets around, sometimes they're really good at, at taking care of those. They don't well, mess your other stuff up. Like okay. <laughs> <laughs> you so can't be that. Sometimes. I've problems in the garden here for about four or five years already, and I've tried a number of different things, and I just can't get a handle on it. Sometimes they say blood meal is supposed to keep some of those smaller predators away too. It does keep keep rabbits. Now a lot of times human hair works really good for keeping deer away if you hang that around the perimeter of your, your gardens. Just go to a beauty shop or something, get human hair, and put that out, out there. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I've done it and it has worked. But for as big as I have, it makes it really difficult. I, I say, well, I can share a little bit. Like the strawberries, I have almost a half an acre of strawberries, three, four, well, two half acres, almost an acre of strawberries. And the robins will come in and eat some, but that's enough strawberries that I can share with them. Okay, yes. <laughs> Lots of stuff. Yes. Okay, um, I've got a very small area and I like planting tomatoes, but I know you're going to rotate your tomatoes into a different spot every year and that's not possible. Is there something I put in the soil so I don't deplete it? You can add some, like I showed those, those that phosphorus and potash are two of the big things. Calcium they use a real lot of. But if you also start mulching around them, that would help too to build that comp compost up. A lot of people say if you have, for instance, if you have clay soil, they say add, add sand to it. That's not necessarily, you'd have to add an awful lot of sand. The best addition for a clay soil is organic mulch. And so if you green, grow green manure crop, for instance, I think a real good one is sweet clovers. They tend to break up the soil really well. That's my friend over the hill, he has real heavy clay, and he just kept growing this green manure crop in there, and that really loosened up that soil. And that does help. And grass clippings are real good. And your, your carbon-nitrogen ratio plays a big figure in that. And then all these extra things you add will add, car add carbon. But one thing a lot of people say, well, if a little is good, then a whole bunch should be better. That's not necessarily true. If you put too much leaves or too much until it's into the soil, it depletes all the nitrogen, because it has to use that nitrogen to break down that material. So you have to watch that, that ratio. But that's why putting it on top is a really good thing, especially in a, in a small area. That's what I'd recommend. Yes? Uh, what do you, uh, is the best way to grow uh, potted plants? I mean, uh, vegetables in pots. They have what they call the earth box, which you can put set aside water. The biggest thing with a potted plant is that most people forget to water. They and forget to what? Forget to water. The potted, the potted plants get, in the hot weather, they drain very quickly. And that's why you can get blossom end rot in a potted plant very, very easily. And that's why if you get some of these or make your own earth box, basically, put your compost and stuff in there, plant your plants, and they have a secondary well that has water in the bottom of it that stays there. You just fill that up and you don't have to worry about it. It lasts for several days. And you just keep checking that. Of course, it can run dry too. But uh, you keep that and it's a lot easier to keep the water consistent for those plants. Yes? Uh, do you have any guidelines for watering tomatoes? Yeah. <laughs> the biggest thing is, is you don't let the soil an inch down dry out. <laughs> if it's dry on top, it's okay, but about an inch down, they have soil probes that you can stick in the soil and they will actually tell you when it's too dry. And then when you do water, do you have the amount that you can well, see, with, with mine, I set mine, uh, I have a timer like this, but you can buy in, uh, which is that? I don't know if I have that in there, AM Leonard, 
I don't think I have that list. I think I have the list there. Dan Leonard has a real good timer that you can put on the, uh, a garden hose. And if you just water for a few hours a day instead of trying to soak them, you know, five or six hours at a time, that's the biggest thing of, of getting too much water at once because then that depletes the oxygen. The, the plants need oxygen as, as well as, as the nutrients to grow. If we put too much water in the soil profile, they can't get that oxygen. And so that's where you gotta be careful of too much water. And that's why the drip lines are really nice because you can set them for a few hours and uh, like this, this plastic keeps that moisture there and still keeps the soil loose and you're not walking on the place where you're, you're growing. When you grow a garden but it's not in a bed, if you're walking next to your plants, you're compressing that soil and you're depleting the oxygen in the soil. So that's, some, that's one thing with nice with the mulch because it also it cushions it. Look. Yes. Do you do any soil testing? I do some soil testing every few years, but I most of the time my soil tests come back. I have high high nutrients, and even in the in the farmland, and most of the time, like my potatoes, I plant after alfalfa, and so that really helps with those. And green manure crops help. And there's some areas that you can send in for a soil test, but most of the time soil tests will say, well, you need so much nitrogen, so much this. And they don't, the most important soil test you can get is how much organic matter is in your soil. And the main reason I say that is, is because that breaks down slowly. If you, you add like these commercial fertilizers, I can say, if you have like a 20-20-20 or 10-10-10, you set that beside your plant, that burns up the organic matter in the soil, hurts the, the microbes, but the biggest thing it does, it makes the, the plant want to grow faster, it gets more watery, and more disease prone too. And then you have to spray it with something else. And so you're, if it's slow, if you're, how would I say that? If your materials, nutrients are released slowly, organic matter release, releases nitrogen. Your soil test won't say that. It won't say that it releases nitrogen, but it does. And that build, releases nutrients in there. And some of your crops like uh, buckwheat, for instance, you can grow buckwheat and it'll actually pull phosphorus out of the air and put it into the soil. And so some crops actually pull that in and use that. And like, if you get a snow or a rain, that actually pulls nitrogen from the atmosphere and puts it into the soil. You notice how clean that smells after a rain or after snow? If you look at snow and you see a blue glow in it, because it has that extra nitrogen in it, and that's putting that into the soil. So usually in those things, if you just watch them closely, they'll, it takes care of themselves, especially if you're if you can't rotate, then I'd say put grass clippings, put something there to help add organic matter to the soil. Okay, anything else? But anyway, have fun growing. It's something that's so enjoyable to do. You can do little things and uh, in your just a little flower bed. You can put some edible landscapes. Have you heard of that? Put something like an edible landscape. Grow things that you can also eat and maybe you can share with your neighbors. <laughs>